Cage Time with John Morgan. And welcome everybody to another edition of Cage Shy with John Morgan. I'm your host, Eric McMahon. If you guys don't have UFC Fight Pass, then you missed this face and that face on the broadcast this past weekend from a sold-out horseshoe casino in Tunica, Mississippi. We're going to dive into that card because there are some prospects that you guys need to be aware with. Also, going to go over UFC on ESPN 49. Holly Holmes takes that loss. Francis Ngannou gets the bag. Jamal Hill ruptures an Achilles. How did that story kind of stay quiet? We're going to get into all that. But before we do, I want to bring in the man. His name is on the marquee. His name is John Morgan. Follow him at Twitter. John Morgan underscore MMA. What is up, brother? Man, it's good. It was a, it was a busy week, to say the least, but it was fun to be out there in the uh, in the Memphis area, we'll say. We were a little bit away from there in Tunica, Mississippi. But uh, as you said, man, you touched on CFFC 121. What a great card. And obviously, it was fun to see you out there handling business, doing your thing. And uh, But I, I, I love it, man. We're seeing real talent develop in that area. You know, CFFC has been coming out there for a while now, and I've been watching these fighters kind of – come along and develop obviously you're out there as well and and uh man there's some real talent in the area that i'm excited about yeah we're gonna dive into that card here in a little bit but i think the the the, the story that broke this past week kind of set the mma world on fire is francis and ganu gets that bag and when i say gets that bag originally it was reported he got eight million dollars for that fight and then jake paul if jake paul does he comes out and says hey listen dummies he got eight figures, not eight million. So let's just do the math on that. He got at least 10 million or above. Wow. Fight yeah, is going to take place October 28th in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I was going to say, unbelievable. It's, it's exciting to see this come together. I mean, this was always the possibility, right? I mean, Francis Ngannou said this from the beginning. You know, he grew up wanting to be a boxer. He grew up idolizing Mike Tyson, and he moved to France in pursuit of that. And, and Fernand Lopez actually kind of turned him down the path of mixed martial arts, but he always maintained that passion for wanting to box. And now he's getting to do it against, I mean, one of the greatest, if not the greatest heavyweight boxer right now in, in a huge paycheck along with it. I mean, this is awesome. I, I just, I'm so happy for Francis Nagano because look, he took a risk, right? He took a risk. He walked away from the UFC. There were no guarantees as to what was going to come next, but he did it to chase a passion. This was the passion, the huge paycheck that comes along with it. Obviously, that means something as well, but I think you got to be happy for the guy as well as the businessman to get all this done. It all came to fruition the way he wanted to do it. I mean, I think when you have Tyson Fury and Francis Ngannou in a ring and Tyson Fury is saying the lineal heavyweight champion of boxing versus the lineal heavyweight champion of mixed martial arts colliding in a squared circle in Saudi Arabia, October 28th. It's a big deal. Whether we think it's going to be competitive, not competitive, one-sided, not, it's a big deal even when Francis, when when Tyson Fury is saying that. Hey, lineal champ versus lineal champ. Well, that's the thing. And you and I are always going to keep it real, Eric. And I, I, to be honest with you, don't expect it to be necessarily competitive. I don't think this is going to be necessarily a great boxing match. I don't know that we're necessarily going to determine who the best heavyweight striker on the planet is. But it's fun. It's cool. If you go into it with that mentality that, like, look, this is something, this is this is once-in-a-lifetime type stuff. I mean, this is, okay, yes, we saw it with Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather, but not as heavyweights and not as two guys that were on top at the time. Conor was certainly on top at the time. Floyd, maybe, maybe not. I mean, th th this is exciting, and it's heavyweights again. And listen, you know, Francis Ngannou does bring that power. I mean, all heavyweights bring power, but Francis Ngannou brings that otherworldly power. So if he connects... Maybe, but that's going to be hard. That's going to be really, really hard against Tyson Fury. So I'm not necessarily looking at this as, oh, now we get to really know who the number one striker on the planet is. We don't. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if Tyson Fury went and did MMA, Francis Nagano would absolutely wipe the floor with them. I mean, even if even if they added kicks to this, if they made this a kickboxing match, Francis Nagano would wipe the floor with them because he's used to training all that. This is Tyson Fury's world, and I expect him to be dominant. But – I can't wait to see the visuals of it. I can't wait to enjoy the spectacle of it. You know they're going to do it up big. It's, it, it's a crazy event. I think if you go into it with that mindset, that this is just craziness and it's fun, let's enjoy it, I, I think you'll have the right mindset for it. Okay, I want to get into how I think it's going to do at the box office. 
But have you seen what Chael Sonnen has had to say about this? I have not. Hey, well, Chael will say some crazy stuff. What did he have to say? I'm going to pair. I was going to read it all, but it's just going to take too long. <laughs> I'm going to paraphrase, right? Because Chael Sonnen's long winded. Yes, he is. He calls Francis Ngannou a scum. Or no, I'm sorry. He calls Tyson Fury a scumbag for taking this fight. And I'm going to paraphrase, right? So, you know, Uncle Chael. I'm sorry if I don't get the tone or the jest or maybe even the sarcasm correct here. But essentially what he says is like, listen, if you take like the best NBA team, we're going to call it the Kobe Shaq Lakers, right? And essentially what the Tom Brady Patriots are doing and saying, hey, come play us in football. How do you think that's going to go? And since, <laughs> since Tyson Fury – is is bringing Francis Ngannou over a guy who's 38 years old on one leg who doesn't compete in that sport never has competed in that sport going against arguably the greatest heavyweight champion of all time certainly this era Chael Sonnen refers to that as a scumbag move what say John Morgan <laughs> Uh, I think Chael Sonnen knows how to stir the pot a little bit. That man knows how to elicit a response. I think, hey, I think he's going to bat for the MMA guy right there and saying, hey, why don't you come over to our world? You know what I'm saying? If you want to, if you want to have these big money fights and you want to put bragging rights on the line, why don't you come do it where there's you know less rules and less restrictions in place? So I, I think, first of all, let's always remember that Chael Sonnen. I love me some Chael Sonnen, but let's always remember his chief directive is to stir up a response and to get people talking he has successfully done so here um but i kind of see what he's saying obviously he always takes facts and turns them up to 11 or 12 or 13 well past the, the 10 on the meter i don't know that he's a scumbag i think tyson fury is a very smart businessman as is francis nagano as well because they're going to generate a lot of revenue uh but i kind of see what he's saying it's like look you know if you want to say who, who's the who's the better fighter Come fight. If we're saying who's the better boxer, okay, we're going to determine who's the better boxer, but we're not going to determine who's the better fighter. If you want to do that, you got to come do that in a cage. All right, I'm going to quote Chael, Uncle Chael here. I said I wasn't, gonna, but I'm going to get him to do it. <laughs> it's so fun, though. It's so fun. What kind of scumbag is Fury, though, man? I've got to tell you, Fury broke my heart. I like this guy, and I like the entertainment. I like so many things about him. You take a guy like Fury, who God made huge, gave great coaches, great training partners, great experiences to. He has weapons and tools that other men can't deal with if they're not armed. And he's going to choose to use those to beat up a guy who's at least 37 with no experience and is on one leg. That's a bully, and it's a scumbag. I would never do that to somebody Jesse James made a lot of money, and there's hitmen that made a lot of money. I mean, there's things that you can do, but you own it. You're a bully, and you're a scumbag. <laughs> oh, there's only one Chael Sonnen. What a take that is, man. I mean, listen, again, there's a, the thing about Chael, the thing that's great about Chael is he's going to blow things up and make him crazy, and he's going to say some wild things, but there's always a little bit of fact where he starts from, right? And he is saying, man, Look, you're taking on this guy that, yeah, Francis Ngannou is kind of up there in age. You know, you talk about being on wet leg. Obviously, he's had the knee surgery and he's recovering from that. And again, he's bringing him over to his sport. He's not venturing into, you know, mixed martial arts. So there's a little bit of, you know, fact in where he's starting from. But uh, I, I, I don't know if I can co-sign it entirely, but it makes me laugh. I, I like it. He's going to bat for the MMA guy. So what? So Chill Sonnen was, was he on city council in Westland, Oregon? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so do you remember the the famous quote? He's like, "I won my election with ninety percent, ninety six percent of the vote in Westland, Oregon." And then somebody goes, "Well, didn't you run un unopposed?" Yes, I did. <laughs> so a little bit of fact: ninety six percent of the ninety six percent of the vote, but he was unopposed. That's so great. That's so great. He got four percent right in against them. I mean, that that's it. That is Chill Sunday. So look, I, look, what he's saying here is exactly I kind of think. What we're saying and the fact that, look, uh, I don't know that this is necessarily a competitive matchup. Like, did Tyson Fury sign up for the biggest test of his career? Is this number one versus number two on the planet? And, like, I'm going to go head-to-head -head with, with the biggest challenge I've ever faced in my life? No, he didn't. He signed up for the big paycheck in the same way that Francis Ngannou signed up for the big check 
So did Tyson Fury. I don't expect this to be necessarily competitive. I think Chael Sonnen is kind of echoing what you and I are saying. He's just doing it in a much more creative and very Chael Sonnen way. But I think that's what we all kind of believe is that, look, if you're going into this thinking like, my man, Tyson Fury is in trouble here. He doesn't know what he signed up for. Our guy, Francis Ngano, he's the hardest hitter on the planet. I mean, what was the thing? Uh, hits like a like a Chevy car. I don't remember what that crazy thing at the, at the press conference was that one time. If you're thinking that, then I think, unfortunately, you're probably going to go in here and end up being a little bit disappointed because Tyson Fury is just an incredible boxer. He's an incre- And he's not just a guy that relies on his power as his heavyweight. He's a guy that relies on phenomenal technique as a heavyweight, incredible athleticism for as large of a man as he is. And I think that's going to be very difficult for Francis Ngannou to navigate. Now, does Francis pack enough power that if he lands, it could get interesting? Yes, he does. And Francis so Ngannou could knock out anybody in the world if he got to some clean. Anybody. That's it. But is he going to be able to catch him clean? That's the problem. I'm not signing up for this as a competitive matchup. This is why, I, this is why I'm, I'm trying to tell people, you know, maybe this is one of those pay-per-views that you, you have some friends over and everybody kind of chips in a little bit. You know, you, you bring it back to the old days where you had all your friends over and you kind of made a little party out of it because it's going to be a spectacle. I don't know that it's going to be a competitive fight, but it's going to be a spectacle. I liken it to Floyd Connor, right? Like in reality, people started buying into the hype train with that. I think the realist knew that really wasn't there, but, but Floyd and the brilliance of Floyd is he carried him too for, for what? Six rounds. He did. He carried him. He, he, he gave people his, their money's worth. And that's the great thing about Floyd. He made, he, nobody walked away from that fight saying like, I got gypped. Because Floyd, it was so masterful in in his craft that he says, I'm going to make you look good for six rounds. I can yep. see that happening here. But um, I want to move to the spectacle of everything because Connor and Floyd are magicians and masterful on the mic, right? In this fight, we have one of the two, that is. I mean, Tyson Fury is, he, he, he is best in class. He he yes, he, is. he is he is Chael Sonnen of the boxing world. Yes, he is. Francis Ngannou. I don't know how much he can sell this fight. Truth be told, how yeah. how big of a fight is this really? How much is it going to sell? Because if you're going to ask me right now, I don't see a ton of marketability in this fight. Oh, boy, it's interesting, right? I mean, you're right. On the mic, Tyson Fury is going to sell it. Francis Nagano is going to sell it on the poster, right? I mean, just uh, you look at the guy. It, like I've always said about Francis Nagano, you don't need to know anything about combat sports whatsoever to look at Francis Nagano and be like, I bet that dude hits really hard, man. I mean, he is just bricked up, you know, huge muscular dude. You can tell he's got power. And then now here's the real challenge, right? And this is another thing that Conor McGregor had to his advantage. The UFC was involved, right? So they were more than happy to give all the footage, all the highlight reel, all that stuff. And I think people may not realize that going into this. Since the UFC is not involved with this, because you may say from the outside looking in, oh, all you got to do is play Francis Nagano highlights, and people are going to go, if they don't know who he is already, they're going to go like, oh, yeah, guess what? They ain't getting those highlights. The UFC is yep. not going to play nice with this. They're not going to be like, yeah, it's not our it's not our deal, but go ahead, use our footage. That's just fine. We understand. We're wishing the best for Francis. Hopefully you guys do a lot of money over there on this box match. They're not going to give him that footage. So it is going to be a little bit more of a challenge. Like I said, it doesn't take a real educated consumer to look at Francis Nagano and be like, I bet that guy hits hard. But they're <laughs> not they're not going to have all the things to their to their uh, at their use that they normally would have if the UFC was involved. So it will be a little bit of a challenge. And do we do we actually know? Because I don't I haven't seen yet. I know all the details are kind of being worked out. Do we know what time this is going to air? Because I'm assuming with it being in Saudi Arabia, they're going to do it in prime time there, which would probably make it in the afternoon here in the United States. Which I can tell you from experience, the UFC always says, you know, if you're doing it in the afternoon take about 20% off the top of what you expect to do at night just because, mm-hmm. number one, people people got things to do in the middle of the day, and number two, it just becomes like an education thing. Like you're just so used to fights being on Saturday night that when they do happen in the day, if you haven't gotten that messaging out there, if you haven't drilled at home over and over that's going to be you know at 2 in the afternoon versus 10 in the evening, uh, it's a big change. So I, I haven't seen the details on that yet, but that pops in my head as well as another challenge logistically that they're going to have to get over. Uh Here's a question about the footage, right? And obviously I knew that UFC was not going to be uh, helpful 
let's say in this, but they do put out spot. They do put out promotional packages that they let everybody run. And are though, and, and Francis and like, you know, promotional footage that was lead up to any pay-per-views new stations carried them. I mean, we could, we could play them on these podcasts if we want to. Um, are those copyrighted as well? They are because they just gave everybody car blanche and they've already run by news conference. Do you have to get a second round of approval? Yeah. So generally those things come with a limit. Like these can only be used for 30 days or these can only be used up until a certain period of time. And then after that, they're supposed to be taken down. Now, do they necessarily go out and make sure that everybody that ever used them actually took them down from wherever they are? No, not really. But in this, this time they will. This time they will. This time they will be watching every single piece. They will be going frame by frame like it's the Zapruder film to see if there's any footage in there that happens to be ours that you don't have a right to. Yeah, man. Interesting to see. Like, I don't know where the hype train is going to go, right? It. I don't see a lot of hype around it other than the, the hype of Francis got over on the UFC. And I mean, that's the only thing I'm really hearing about this. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. You got anything else on this? No, I mean, I think that that's the interesting thing is, is what you just pointed out. Everybody's like, oh, Francis got over on the UFC. Like, okay, I guess you could see it that way. But I, I, to be honest with you, I think all parties are pretty happy with, with the way things turned out. I mean, John Jones versus Stipe Miocic at Madison Square Garden. That's not a bad heavyweight title fight for the UFC. So I, I think that's the thing that's bothered me about this whole situation is, and I guess that's the hot take society, whatever, like there has to be a winner and there has to be a loser and who got over on who, you know, did, did Francis fumble the bag? Did, did, did Francis sh- tell Dana what's up? I mean, I think both parties are pretty pretty satisfied with where everything is, but there's going to be some real challenges in making this thing a huge financial uh, hit. Now, I mean, Francis and Tyson, their their money's guaranteed, so what do they care? But we'll see how it all plays out. All righty. This past weekend, we're going to start on Friday night because, in my opinion, it was the better of the two shows. <laughs> I mean, just for the talent involved, as far as I'm concerned, you know? Yeah, yeah. Especially just the on-air talent. <laughs> this past weekend, Friday at the Horseshoe Casino in Tunica, Mississippi, Cage Fire, Cage Fury Fighting Championships held their show. And every fight on this main card ended up being a finish. It was a spectacular show, spectacular finishes. This is legitimately the premier regional promotion, the feeder system to the UFC. Now I want to take a step back because even two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, everybody would look at LFA and saying, that's the standard you got to win in. And that's the promotion you got to get to. If you want to get to the UFC, I think that is long gone. Cage Fury fighting championship is what LFA used to be. What I stand correct by saying that you think. I mean, obviously, I'm a little bit biased because I'm involved with it. So I'm going to say that, uh, yes, that's great. And, by the way, I got a lot of friends over at LFA as well. They still have a fine production. Ed Source has been a good buddy of mine for years and years and years. So they're still doing a great job. But I will say, at the very least, I do believe CFSC has has taken a a step alongside them. I mean, we're we're definitely in in the running for that because there's so much good talent coming through our ranks. Good talent. The heavyweight or the uh, main event was headlined by a gentleman named Raheem Forrest. Now, Raheem uh, was the uh, welterweight champion of CFFC on his first title defense in kind of shocking fashion, loses it and gets submitted um, really by a dumb mistake, made one little error and just never recovered. But he headlines this past weekend. And if you guys want to see a horrendously devastating knockout go watch that fight it only lasted 26 seconds and i was not the ref in the cage for that fight because raheem it, it, i've trained with him hundreds of times over the years so there was a conflict there i couldn't be the ref in the main event but i was the timekeeper for that event that match right so the official time is going to see say 26 seconds of the very first round in reality it probably should have been 24 and a half because i go <laughs> Oh, and then I go, oh, shit. Grab my stopwatch and went like that. 
I have a job to do here. I forgot I'm supposed to do that. That is incredible. First of all, props to you for uh, for noting the, the potential conflict, right, and not allowing yourself to be in there for the cage. I think that just goes to show your integrity that, you know, I'll put somebody else in. It's a main event. It's a main event on USC Fight Pass. You know, if you hadn't said anything, would anybody know? Maybe and, I not. Was charged get- with, and I was charged with uh, divvying the card. Yeah, respect to you for doing that. But, yeah, this was a phenomenal performance from Raheem Forrest. It was a fight that, that a lot of people were looking forward to. Andre Petrosky, the fast-rising USC middleweight, man, he was my, my broadcast partner. He was super fired up for this. He, You know, we all knew Raheem Forrest. He'd had a phenomenal fight with Colin Luberts right there in that exact same cage. Phenomenal five-rounder to win the title. And he had been really scouting Treston Vines as well and watching a lot of his tape. And he's like, look, man, stylistically – I think this is going to be a really, really entertaining matchup, a key matchup. This was kind of Treston's, you know, coming out opportunity, man, to really make a name for himself. But Raheem was frustrated from that last one. He doesn't like to talk about a whole lot. And I don't know how much he shared with with you or you've been a part of this, but he had a a terrible weight cut last time out. He had some travel conflicts and some issues. He doesn't like to talk about it because he realizes that, like, it sounds like I'm making an excuse, but it's reality. And, And he said, look, man, I was... I was warming up in the back that night, and he's like, I felt like a negative three-stripe white belt. He's like, I just couldn't get my body moving. I couldn't, it was just well, weird, and to man. compound that, I did talk to him about it, you know, af- after this past win. I saw him wow. at the restaurant, and after the win, and, and he was just saying, yeah, with the last fight, now that I've gotten it behind me, um, the 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 sauna – at the, at the place that I was cutting weight stopped working. My right. flight got delayed coming in. I didn't get in until the day I was supposed to start cutting weight. Then when I started cutting weight, the sauna broke. I had to then go in like a cab and go find another gym by himself to cut weight. I mean, that's horrendous. It's crazy. And I mean, you know, he, he doesn't make excuses for it, but that's actually how he never talked about it before the fight. He only just started to talk about it recently. And, and I think that shows you the character that he is. He, he's, he's always said in the lead up to this, he said, yep, you know what? Charlie Racky was the better man that night. He beat me. Charlie Racky gets the call to the USC after that. So you can imagine Raheem could be like extremely bitter, right? Instead, he says, you know what, man? I'm proud of that guy. I'm happy for that guy, man. He's been grinding. He's been paying his dues. And I'm so happy he got to call the UFC. And I'm going to earn my way to the UFC as well. And I just think that shows you, again, the character of a human being and an athlete that I'm not going to let circumstances, you know, make me bitter or, 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 or give me excuses. Like, no, I'm just going to go in. I'm going to work harder. And, man, he worked harder. He came in. And he came in saying, I have to prove something. I have a statement to make. 26 seconds, 24 and a half seconds. You made a statement. You know what I mean? That was just – that might have been the best Raheem Forrest we've ever seen. And, by the way, we've seen some pretty good versions of Raheem Forrest along the way. He knocks him out stiff, standing up. And then before uh, he can fall, gets three or four more in. It was scary. Just unloaded on, man. It really was. He just – I mean, Treston was out on his feet, as you said. Those first shots got it done. But – I mean, Raheem's just doing what he's supposed to do, and, and, and he just continues to throw punches. And, man, just an absolute – I mean, what a, an exclamation point. The whole place was on their feet, man. It was it was incredible. And, uh, I, I, you know, it was so cool for Charlie Racky to get the invite to the UFC because I like old Chuck Buffalo as well. He's had some great fights in the CFFC as well. But I got to think, man, the timing of this, the fact that Raheem only needed 26 seconds, you got to think he's healthy, that there that, that were no issues. Dana White's contender series kicking up in a couple of weeks. I, I just I just have to believe an invitation is coming for Raheem Forrest to fight at the UFC Apex later this summer. If it doesn't, if he's at minimum not on contender, where I really think a contract should just be awarded to this guy, he is that fun to watch. Um, then it's a travesty if he doesn't even get on the uh, contender series. But I think we're both... 99% sure he will. 99% sure, man. And, and and a Memphis product, right? I mean, how cool is that, man? This this kid is, I mean, he's 26 years old. To me, that's still a kid. That's that's just starting to really enter, you know, the physical prime of an athlete and a fighter. And, and he's really getting that knowledge. And you know the backstory more than I do. But I, I think the, the story is so cool that, you know, as an amateur, like, wasn't necessarily the, the blue chip that everybody's like, wow, that's going to be the guy. You know, had a lot of losses along the way but just continue to get better and better and better and better. And now, as you said, I mean, I, I, I agree, to be honest with you. I think he should get a USC contract right away. But, you know, I, I know that obviously the USC likes the contender series. They like that as an avenue to get people in. And, and it is nice. You know, you get exposed to the USC family a little bit. You get a, to get yourself on, 
on ESPN Plus and get a little bit of exposure and they get a little of your backstory and all that. So uh, at a minimum, I think that must be coming. But I just super happy. I mean, there's nothing I love more than seeing these athletes like really like living their dreams, chasing their dreams, and then going and delivering with performances like this. And uh, it, it was spectacular. And as you said, spectacular night. Six out of six finishes on the main card. Only had one decision the whole night. I mean, it was fun. And Raheem Forrest is battle-tested. I mean, that's the, that's the best thing, like you said, is his fight with Colin Luberts, training oh. partner to Colby Covington. Uh, one of the, the fight, fight of the year candidate on UFC Fight Pass. Go back and check that out as well. If you don't know the name, Raheem Forrest, learn it now. Check him out. He will be in the show very soon. Another guy I both – I think we can both agree that will and should be in the show as well is a Danny left hand of God Barlow. Yeah. Danny Barlow, bro. I mean, this dude continues to impress every time. Uh, it was his second fight in the CFSC cage. Uh, you know, I, I thought he looked good the first time out. We had him back and he just delivers another spectacular finish against again, another guy from the area and Jared skill. that was very talented. A lot of people were looking forward to this when they went in there, you know, looked like it was going to be a competitive matchup on paper. Uh, and, and maybe it was on paper, but in practice, it, it absolutely wasn't. Just a, a devastating finish for uh, – for, and I love that nickname, Left Hand to God, Danny Barlow. I, I was saying yesterday, every time I hear it, like, I, it makes me – I don't know if it's based in any comparison to Mirko Krokop, but I always think of it. It's like right leg hospital, left leg cemetery, left hand to God, Danny Barlow. So, phenomenal win, and, and he's another one. To be honest, I think both these guys will probably end up on contender series. I, I'm hoping they do. I don't know for sure, but I'm hoping they both get invites to contender series because, again – the timing is perfect, right? You get a fight right before Contender Series is about to book. You get out of there with a spectacular result. You get out of there healthy, right? You don't go through a war where you need time off and your body needs to recover. Like, you're ready to go. I, I hope we're seeing both these guys on Contender Series this summer. The one difference I see between the two. Now, people have been trying to fantasy book that fight. Danny Barlow, Raheem Forrest. And I've been a proponent of saying, don't book that, that. That is too big of a fight to happen on the regional scene. I would. I don't want any anyone in those guys to take an L. But what a dog fight that would be between them two. But Raheem Forrest threw a lot more experience in the CFFC cage, and Danny Barlow only two two fights in. Uh, one even being on an undercard. So uh, the battle testedness. We don't know how battle tested Danny Barlow really is yet. But I can tell you, I've ref this kid on numerous occasions. I probably ref. Four of his six victories. And I was the man in the cage that night. Um, he is a special talent. Raheem Forrest is a talent and a savage that will not stop. What I can tell you about Danny Barlow is he is a special talent. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's a great assessment because what I feel like is, I mean, not that they're both not great athletes, they are, but I feel like Danny Barlow was just kind of athletically gifted, right? And he had that, whereas Raheem had to like just really grind and put in the work to get it to work for him. It, so it's kind of two like different paths, but thankfully they both found that path and they both put the work in, they both delivered on it. And I'm excited to see what they do. And I agree with you. I mean, that's a phenomenal fight. Obviously, uh, you know, we, we'd love to have it in the CFFC cage, but that's a UFC level fight. And I hope that they, they get to have it there. Uh, because they both do appear on their way to the USC for me. So, uh, again, man, it's just so cool to come out there. Uh, you know, the, the Horseshoe Tunica, you know, all the we, – we've done a couple different uh, venues out there in the Tunica area, but obviously we're pulling a lot of talent from the Memphis area and all the – you know, the South as well, and there's just some great, great developing talent in the area, and it's fun to go out there and, 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 and find those athletes and to see them kind of start to make their way to the next stage. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a great promotion, especially for this region when you guys come through. But you were supposed to take a flight that next morning. Oh, by the way, got to have a beer. You got to meet my wife. Yeah, it was fun. It was our it was first, fun. The first night that she got away from both the kids. Either I've been gone, she's been gone, but we've never both been gone. So we stayed down at the, the Horseshoe Tunica. And, um, yeah, I sat with you and Rob, the CEO of or the president of CFFC, and you said, the first night away, you bring her to a fight show? <laughs> that's what we do that's how that's how we operate yeah so but the next morning you were supposed to jump a flight back out to vegas and go to ufc on espn 49 you didn't make it a little travel issues right <laughs> 
Yeah, man. I don't know what was going on, man. I mean, uh, I threw, I flew uh, from Memphis to Dallas and then Dallas back to Vegas. And Dallas, man, DFW Airport was just packed, man. There were lots of flights delayed. So I don't know if there was some weather somewhere in the country. I know in Vegas sometimes it's crazy. It gets so hot in Vegas. We have delays because the heat causes issues with the with the planes being able to actually operate properly. So they cause delays. So we had some delays. So I was late making it home and, and didn't make it to the apex. Ended up just coming back to the house and, and watching the card at home was bummed because I always hate to, to not be at the show. But I will say, man, uh, that was probably a bit adventurous of a schedule to try to think that I was coming straight back and going straight to that. It was nice to be able to just kind of roll up into my office and watch the show on ESPN+. Plus. So in the main event of the Apex show UFC on ESPN 49, uh, Myra Buena Silva defeats Holly Holm with a ninja choke 30 se- 38 seconds into round number two. Now, a lot of people say, what's a ninja choke? It's uh, basically just a... Front choke, but ultra yeah. impressive in doing so. And dare I say, won the striking exchanges in the first round, too. Yeah, really was I- I- exciting to see. I mean, this was Mario Buena Silva's biggest test to date, no question about it. Facing a former champion in Holly Holm, a former champion, Holly Holm, who knows that, look, can't fight forever. She's 41. She's still a phenomenal athlete at 41 oh, years old, but no. Specimen. Oh, unbelievable, man. 20 plus years of combat sports experience, but she knows, you know, I can't be here forever, so I got to make the run. So this was a motivated Holly Holm and and Myra Buena Silva just came out. And as you said, aggressive on the feet, was willing to engage and move forward and take some to give some. And then came out in that second round and and Holly, you know, was was pressing forward, looking to wrestle in. And Myra just locked up that choke. As you said, it's basically just like a rear naked choke setup, but you're doing it from the front position. And so she locked it up and got the squeeze and you could tell once she had – I mean, she did everything perfect, right? Hand up, using the chin to hide the hand so you can't peel it away. I mean, did yeah. everything perfect. Compressing them shoulders oh, down. Just phenomenal. The technique was there, beautiful. Um, and she picks up the win and, 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 and unbeaten, unbeaten since she left the flyway ranks. Myra had a little bit of success at flyway, you know, some wins, some losses, was kind of settled in, decided to make the move to 135. And now, man, listen, she's in, she's in the talk now. She's in that title picture. We got a vacant belt with Amanda Nunes walking away. She's at least in the discussion now. I think that fight in the impressive fashion of what it was, headlining a card on ESPN – against the aforem- aforementioned Holly Holm, which we all know the, 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 you know, the pedestal that a lot of people put her on. That's the fight to make to a degree, just basically coming off this. Juliana Pena has been on the sidelines chirping a lot, right? W- you know, one about Amanda Nunez uh, retiring and uh, she, Juliana Pena is obviously going to get that shot, right? With the vacant belt. But I do believe with beating a fighter of a Holly Holm stature, Silva probably is that person, and she's calling for it. Well, that's the thing is that, number one, um, she started to speak English, which is good. And I always say this with a little, you know, I'm not saying that you can't promote yourself without speaking English, but listen, if you're a foreign fighter, the majority of the business gets done in the United States. If you can speak English, it just helps. And she's going out there and she's doing it, right? And – She's calling out Juliana Pena. She's talking trash with Juliana Pena. She's she's laughing at her. She's saying she's silly. In the pre-fight buildup, because a lot of people felt like coming into this week, the fight that made sense, me included, was, was Juliana Pena, who's number one, and Raquel Pennington, who's number two, right? It's number one versus number two, so that's obviously there. They have some history together on the Ultimate Fighter. So, I mean, it just seemed to make sense, right? Uh, but but Myra Buena Silva, in the pre-fight buildup to this at Media Day, you know, she was kind of asked, well, what do you think about the title picture? Is this in there? And, and, and do, do you think maybe Pena and Pennington is the fight to make? And she straight up said, she's like, nobody wants to see this fight. This is a boring fight. Nobody wants to see this fight happen. I mean, just already laying the groundwork. You know, she's like, I'll be both of them. And then she's talking trash about Julian Pena. So she's she is in the discussion. Now, a lot of things happen when it comes to a USC title shot, right? It, it, you know, you know it as well as anybody. But just so everybody understands, it's not just who's got the ranking. It's who's available health-wise because people are always dealing with injuries. It's Where's the fight going to take place? If you need, you know, if you if you've got something on the card that needs to take place in Abu Dhabi, you're going to look for maybe geographic ties to that region. If it's Australia, geographic ties to that region. You know, you're looking for things to, to do out there. So there's a lot of things that factor in. But I, I will tell you this: I still think Pena and Pennington is kind of the leader on the backstretch in terms of getting booked. But I'm telling you right now, with that performance, Mara Buena Silva, she's charging up, man. She's right there in the discussion. And if 
a location of a fight dictates it. If the schedule of somebody's availability causes some issues, I think she could very easily jump in and put herself in that title shot. I think she is in the title shot. And, and, and just for everything that we did say, right? I'm not going to say that Silva's wrong in saying people don't really want to say that fight. And, and this is no dis- disrespect to, to um, Raquel Pennington, right? But it's somebody who's been in the, in, in the UFC for an extended period of time. Somebody who has had their shot. Somebody who has come up razor, you know, got there, but just couldn't get over the hump. You know, built theirself back up, got there, couldn't get over the hump, right? It was kind of a rinse and repeat type thing. And that, it, it, as opposed to Myra Buena Silva come up and in spectacular fashion on a, you know, Apex show that is on prime time ESPN Saturday night dispatches, not a great fighter, dispatches a legend in that division named Holly Holm. It, it was set you, up perfect. You know, as you're saying it, I, I I think you might be right. I think you might have just changed me because here's what I think. And there's a reason that a lot of people were kind of putting down Penny and Penny is that they both lost to Amanda Nunes, right? So whoever wins, you just look at him and you go, okay, great, you're the champ. But we all know that if Amanda was here, you wouldn't be champ because she walked away. Mario Buenasua hasn't lost to Amanda Nunes, right? And that may sound like a silly thing because would I pick Amanda Nunes against her? Yes, I would. I'd pick Amanda Nunes against anybody. She's the women's GOAT for a reason, but we didn't see it. It never happened. So at least if she wins the title, at least if she wins the title, you're not saying, well, you know, I mean, you lost to the, to the quote unquote real champ. You're just, you know, holding her belt since she walked away. At least she could say, Hey, not my fault. I would have taken Amanda Nunes. I mean, as a fellow Brazilian, I have a lot of respect for her and I have over, I would have fought her for for me. Yeah, she walked away. Not my fault. So she can at least say that. So I tell you what, man, I I, I still, I, you know, until you said that, now that I really think about it, you might be right. That that might be the angle they go for. All right. Check mark in the box for Eric over here. <laughs> you might have switched me on that one. You might have switched me on that one. Okay. From one title talk to another the light heavyweight champion, Jamal Hill ruptures his Achilles tendon in reportedly – a fighters only international fight week pickup basketball game. Okay. Oh man. Now, if that's well, one that's that sucks. One, I can't believe that that's actually happening with current champions in it. Do you know what the most like so rec league sports per capita is are the most dangerous sports in the world, like softball you know, basketball, whatever, because people aren't playing their normal sports or they're not built to like burst in those ways. And injuries happen all the time. You see guys like me and you, if we were to go to play basketball right now, we're going to pull our hamstrings or whatever. I'm in good shape, but I'm not built to do that anymore. It blows my mind that Jamal Hill is playing in a game like that to start with. Yeah, it's kind of wild. Uh, it's funny, to your point, um, over the years, obviously been covering this game for a long time, but there would be times where a journalist would get together and play like pickup basketball games. And I know two different guys that blew, that ruptured their Achilles playing pickup basketball games for exactly what you said. And it is wild. I mean, it's cool. On the one hand, like everybody's got their YouTube channels now and everybody's trying to get content. Hey, this will be fun. Let's all get together and let's, you know, First of all, it's them just getting to hang out. It's, it's, it's you know, the brotherhood of, of the USC roster getting to hang out and shoot hoops and have some fun. And they're all creating content around it. You know, let's have some cameras following us around. Yes, there's some bragging rights, but then we'll put this all out there. But, yeah, for this to happen, I mean, it kind of makes you think right away, like, well, that'll never happen again. Like, the USC is definitely going to make sure there are no more pickup basketball games happening during International Fight Week. Again, that's the reports that I've seen. I believe it was Damon Martin who came out with that report. I haven't had a chance to speak with anybody. We talked about the schedule that you and I both were on, so I'm not sure that that's 100% what happened. But Damon, obviously a very, very reputable reporter in the industry, if he's saying that that's what happened, that's what happened. So, unfortunate. And, yeah, I mean, Jamal Hill comes out and says and, – and I think, boy, if you haven't watched his video, speaking of his YouTube channel, the emotion of him delivering this message. He announced it himself on his own YouTube channel, and he is fighting back tears the whole time. And, in fact, when he finishes the announcement, they even leave the camera running a little bit, man, and he is just – devastated but to his credit i will give him all the respect in the world jamal hill says you know what man i got this opportunity because yuri prohaska got injured and he was a quality enough individual to say hey i'm giving up my belt so the division can move on and now i'm doing the same and he's literally fighting back tears as he says it but he says i'm gonna do the same i'm gonna give up this light heavyweight title 
I mean, uh, if you weren't a Jamal Hill fan before, I think you have to be now, man. That is that is a, a class individual, and, and you just got to feel bad for him, man. And Yuri Prohaska comes out and says the same thing. Only somebody who's been in this position understands what it really takes to make that decision. And I commend you for this. I respect you for this decision. But where does this leave us? Where is Yuri Prohaska, first of all? Where is he in recovery in his... In, in all of this, who would be those challengers at the 205? Because let's recap, Prohaska on the shelf beats Glover Teixeira who, uh, to, for the belt, and then Glover Teixeira retires. You have a light heavyweight matchup coming up right now. You know, the Polish freaking hammer. And, um, oh, gosh, uh, You've got the Brazilian killer. <laughs> yes. Uh, Pahea. Okay. <laughs> and you got Yuri Prohaska sitting out here. I, where do we go with this? Is it that winner of that fight, meaning Prohaska at a to be determined, probably well down the line? Yeah. Spot? Here's, I'm, I'm just going to lay out a prediction right now. So there's a lot of people that right away said, all right, well, look, as you said, we got Jan Blahovich, we got Alex Pahea. They're scheduled for next week in Salt Lake City. You know, that's a huge co-main event of a pay-per-view. Why don't we just put the title on that fight? Now, I'm sure those guys wouldn't necessarily argue too much, but there's a couple reasons not to do that. Number one, those guys have been training for three rounds. In, a, in On a week's notice, you're going to tell them, now now get ready for five. You Salt can't Lake City, do it with a guy making his light heavyweight debut either. Agreed. Agreed. That's tough. And, and, and it is, you know, it is a fight that's at elevation as well. So now you're talking about more, I mean, that that could I mean that's a big change as well as to go from three rounds to five to elevation. But you also don't get the opportunity to really market the title and to really kind of build into that. You already have a really big main event with Dustin Poirier and Justin Gaethje for the BMF title. So here's what I think. I'm just going to lay out a prediction right now. We know we have John Jones and Steve Miocic in November at Madison Square Garden. That's mm -hmm. that pay per view, right? We know we have December in Las Vegas, and for the longest time, you and I have been talking about early, early this year. I said, hey. That, that date in December, circle that one for Conor McGregor. That's where Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler are going to turn. But Conor McGregor has not re-entered uh, the USADA testing pool, and so I think he's still hoping that maybe they can find a way to get it done in December. I don't believe USADA is going to grant him that, uh, that, uh, that exemption. So that leaves us with a date in December, pay-per-view headliner in Las Vegas. I'm going to just lay out the prediction now. I think that's where we get Yuri Prochaska against the winner of Jan Blahovich and Alex Pajeda at USC Tiny 291, and we crown a new light heavyweight champion there. So for Hos Yuri will be fully healthy by then. Is he fully healthy now, back to training full-time? Yeah, my understanding is he's back, the recovery is good, and, and he's he's looking to book a fight. So that seems to be the one that makes – that's the one that makes sense to me. All right. Well, you heard it from John Morgan first. Let's see if it plays out. But this guy, uh, we call him – no, Nostradamus Morgan for a reason. So it's I mean, it's it's an educated guess, right? It's an educated guess. All righty. Well, two weeks away, BMF title on the line. Can't break down too much of the fight yet because we got another show to do next week before we break it down. But how freaking excited are you for the car crash that is going to be Dustin Poirier and Justin Gaethje? I'm telling you right now, you didn't see it because you were busy working this past Friday night, but we ran a promo for the BMF title during our CFSC 121 broadcast, and we came out of the commercial for it, and I said straight up, and I'll say it again, if you're not excited for this fight, we can't be friends. I don't care how cool you are, <laughs> how nice you are, what kind of person you are, if you're not excited for this fight, we just cannot be friends. I mean, this is MMA at the highest level, but also excitement at the highest level, right? I mean, these are two of the best guys to ever do it, but they're also two of the most exciting, two of the most dangerous, two of the most, I mean, they just go out there and, and car crashes, as you said, man. It's just they go out there, and I, I am I am fired up for this. I'm even fired up for the BMF title. I know when it was, you know, when the, when the BMF title was first introduced for Jorge Mazadal versus Nate Diaz, I was like, what are we doing? We're just making up belts now. But then they came out with this beautiful black and silver belt. You know, they had the rock come out and, and award it, and I'm like, okay, all right, I, I, I like it. And if there's ever a fight to, to see who is the baddest mother, mm, right, it's this one right here, man. I, I am I am pumped up for this. W you know, whether it had a title of any kind on the line or not, it would still be just an amazing rematch of an amazing fight. 
But uh, you add in the BMF title, give it a little bit of extra flavor. I can't wait for this. Is there going to be anybody that kind of gives out the BMF title? I know we had the Rock last time, and we had the Rock at this point leading up. Have you got any inside knowledge here? I, I don't know if it's actually going to happen, but it was brought to Dana White's attention that Jorge Masvidal had mentioned that he would like to be there to give the winner the BMF title. Since he retired with the BMF belt, that Jorge Masvidal wanted to put the belt on the new one. And Dana White at that press conference said, you know what? I like that idea. Let's make it happen. Now, have the phone calls been made? Have the, have the, have the uh, uh, plane tickets been booked? I don't know yet, but that supposedly is the working plan. And I like it. I like it. Hand it down. I'm, I'm here for that. You know, yep. like, yeah, man. And it's a different weight class. So it's not like the biggest deal in the world. Yeah. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. And um, here's what I'm really interested about this fight without breaking it down too much. Cause we'll break down. Who's got the better leg kicks. Who's got the better boxing. Yeah. I don't know. Blah, 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 blah. The pace that both of these guys set. Who is going to take the back? Who is going to take the first back step backwards? And being at elevation, if anybody has worked out in Salt Lake City at that elevation, man, there's the re- there's reasons that like the training grounds are Olympic training grounds are in elevation because it just destroy it just your lungs burn so bad when you're at elevation and you can't take in as deep of a breath. With the pace that both of these guys set in the car crash that we're no is going to happen. I'm interested to see, is that elevation going to affect one guy more than the other, both or none at all? Yeah, it's a very, very fair question. It's one that's, uh, it's intriguing, right? Because Justin Gaethje does train at elevation, right? He trains in Colorado. Meanwhile, Dustin Poirier trains down at American top team. One of the greatest teams, of course, in the world, but it's in the heat of Florida, right? It's at sea level. So will that change it? Now, Dustin Poirier, we know, I mean, an absolute dog, right? Like, I mean, that dude pushes till the very end. We've never seen a situation where, like, ah, oh, Dustin Corey just ran out of gas right there. Like, man, that dude, that man just finds another gear, finds another level, and continues to bring it. But it's a very, very fair question to ask. And, and you're right, man. Salt Lake City, there was a pay-per-view there last year, and that's what a lot of people said afterwards, man. They walked out of there going, my goodness, I did not know how bad the elevation was going to affect me here. It's a real thing. You know, a lot. there's a lot of athletes that try to say, like, ah, it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, 15 minutes. It's whatever. Like, it, it doesn't affect me. Like, no, no, no. It's real. It's not something that's just made up or psychological. It impacts your performance. And if we want a, an example that we can point to where it affected somebody who's in cardio, we thought was above approach. Do you remember Cain Velasquez losing his strap in Mexico City? And he was exhausted after round one, he could never find his breath. And Verdum, who was out there acclimated for, I believe, six weeks leading up to that training in the Mexico City elevation where Velasquez, I think, only came out like 10 days early or even just a week early in the stark difference. And nobody ever has ever questioned Cain Velasquez's cardio. That was that was the whole thing, right? Cardio Kane, man. Like, not only was he a great wrestler, not only was he a great striker, not only was he aggressive, but he was just never going to stop. And that was what made him such an effective tool at the heavyweight division was the fact that, like, you're not going to outwork this guy. You're not going to outpace this guy. He's going to push you to your, at your exact limit. And, yeah, it was funny. As you were talking about it, that was literally the number one example that came to my head of, like, wow, if you ever want to question whether or not this is real, yeah, look at what just happened. And, and you said, I mean, the, the, the veteran in Verdum came out there super early, not a little bit early, super early, actually went to a higher altitude, went to a place that was even further up the mountains and set up camp there and did all his training there. And man, did it pay dividends. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, I mean, it's, it has to have at least some factor in there. And as we said, Gaethje trains at elevation, but dude, Dustin Poirier is a dog. These two are just two of the baddest. Like I said, I know I said it off the top, but I'm saying again, if you're not excited, we just can't be friends, bro. These are two of the most action-packed dudes in the sport today. This is a blessing of a main event. It doesn't get better than this. Well, good thing we can still be friends because I am fired the <laughs> F up about the BMF title, Poirier Gaethje. It doesn't get, if you are a fan of this sport, it does not get better than this. It could get bigger, spectacle and titles could be on the line it does not get better though that's a great that's a great 
That's a great way to put it. And I'm, and I'm happy to hear that, Eric, because, I mean, I would still co-host a show with you. I mean, we would still be co <laughs> I would just make it clear we are not friends and don't ever say that we are friends. But we are friends. We are friends because you, that's a great way to put it. That's what I say. This is one of those fights that, like, you don't really need to have the BMF title on the line. I think it adds a little flavor. And if Masvidal's in the building and all that, it's cool. It makes it fun. But that's it. You know, is this a number one contender fight? Maybe. Maybe the winner gets a title shot. But we don't know that for sure. It doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. It just doesn't get better than this in terms of action-packed fights. Perfect way to describe it. Well, we're going to end it on that note. I got the sign, the seal of approval for Mr. John Morgan. Went over. <laughs> Francis got that bag. Prospects to watch from this past weekend, CFFC in Tunica, Mississippi. If you missed it, go check it out. It's still up on Fight Pass. I uh, see this pretty face in the cage as well. Ha, uh, you know, Myra Beno Silva. Does she get that shot or not to be determined? I believe she should. John Morgan, I may have pulled him to the dark side. Jamal Hill, what you doing? Playing in pick up basketball games. Today. You're the light heavyweight champion of the world. But, man, like, listen, they're competitors and everything. So you you probably weren't going to tell the guy. Nobody could tell the guy no. He's probably going out there wanting to dunk on people, right? I, and, I, I think that I think new UFC contracts might be telling them no moving forward. I think there might be some new language in the deals after this. I got a funny story. So uh, obviously everybody knows now by now I work for the Memphis Grizzlies and uh, we had a all staff three on three basketball tournament. They asked me to play. I said, are you out of your mind? I'm going to get hurt. And I was funny. I was talking to like one of our HR staff and I said, I go, I go, this is not a good idea, right? <laughs> Somebody is going to get hurt. And somebody's going to get hurt bad. They may work in basketball, but they don't play basketball. Our on-air talent, uh, Jessica Benson, amazing, talented uh, sports anchor. You know, she hosts a daily show called uh, um, The Jessica Benson Show on Grind City Media. Check it out. She ruptures her Achilles tendon playing three-on-three Grizzlies basketball tournament. Terrible. That's like, and that's like a year recovery, right? I mean, that's, that's one that you're out for a while, man. You're in a boot, you're having surgery, you're doing all kinds of stuff. And it's I heard it's crazy. painful too. I've heard it's painful. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 From what I know. Right. Well, uh, she sits next to me at work and she looked, she didn't look happy all the time. <laughs> look at that. That's funny. That's funny. That's bad, uh, man. I, I'm telling you, they're going to have to change. There's no way that basketball game is ever happening again. No way. <laughs> Especially, well, not, not, not with any current talent. No, absolutely. Yeah, Hall of Famers, go do it. Guys that we're not trying to book fights with, go do whatever you want. Yeah, you yeah. got a belt on you, sit your ass down. <laughs> yeah, DC, you're the reigning yeah. champ, go for it, man. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so uh, that's a fun episode. Not a lot to talk about. There wasn't anything groundbreaking this past week or so, but, uh, you know, got to talk about a coming town. It was fun. Always love catching up with my man, John Morgan. Two weeks away, BMF title on the line this week. We do have an, uh, a card coming up from the O2 Arena. Break it down for us really quick. Main event. Yeah, uh, first of all, man, Tom Aspinall versus Marcin Tabura. It's, it's a return for Tom Aspinall, a guy that really looked like he's kind of the future of the heavyweight division, but had an injury, a knee injury that he had to have reconstructive surgery with. He spent a year away. He's coming back. He's fighting in his native country in England against Marcin Tabura, who's you know not necessarily a top contender, but just a durable dude that will put you to the test, that will not go away easy. It's a great test back for Tom Aspinall in his return because Tom Aspinall really does look like he's going to fight for a title at, at some point in his career. Young guy, incredibly athletic, great grappling, and this will be a big test back for him against Marcin Tabura. As you said, it's in the O2 Arena. It's in London, England, so it's an early start. It's on ESPN+. Plus, uh, but I believe the first fight prelims, I want to say, are 12 p.m. Eastern in the main card at 3 p.m. Eastern. So this is one of those fight cards that's during the day, which, I, I, I to be honest – I enjoy it a little bit, man. As much as I love the sport, it's kind of nice to have a Saturday night every now and then. So I love getting the fights out of the way. So uh, it, I, I enjoy these every now and then. So it'll be a big week for me. I'm leaving uh, for Florida on Thursday. We got another CFSC event down in Tampa, the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino on Thursday. I'll fly back on Friday. Even if I get delays, I'll still make it back in time. And then I'll get to watch the UFC from London on Saturday. So uh, another busy weekend that looks like it should be a lot of fun. That is awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing how Aspinall looks in his return. Is he still going to look like a doppelganger of Frank Mir? That's all I'm curious about. By the way, oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, that's never going away. He is definitely related to Frank Mir. Somehow, some way, he's related to Frank Mir. I'll tell you one that, that, one that I'm just going to throw out there that uh, the, the, the grappling enthusiasts like yourself and myself will be looking for. Paul Craig 
making the move down to middleweight to take on Andre Muniz. That might mm -hmm. be – I mean, look, there's uh, – look, uh, Molly McCann I just is circled, back. I just circled it. That's it. That's it. I mean, Nathaniel Wood against Andre Feely should be – I mean, there's some fun fights on this. There's not a lot of title implications. This is one of those cars that looks like it's a lot of fun. But that one, Paul Craig versus Andre Muniz – Circle it, circle it. We're looking forward to that one. Boom. For John Morgan, I'm Eric McMahon. Enjoy the fights.